I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. My soul waits for the quarantine to be lifted. To be back in restaurants or in parks. My soul waits for my kids to get out of the house and back into school. More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. There is something to be said about the waiting and the longing and the hoping that we get both from our psalm today and even from our gospel, the story of Lazarus. Waiting, longing, and hoping, and it happens a lot in life. As a matter of fact, that's one of the lessons that we parents have to instill within our children, not just once, but over and over again. Not just that good things come to those who wait, but sometimes just be patient. No, I don't know when we're going to get there. No, I'm not sure when this is going to be done. No, just wait and be patient, please. And it's hard. It's hard for kids. It's hard for adults. It's really hard for anyone who was either hoping for something good to happen or hoping for something miserable or difficult to stop. I wait for the Lord. Regardless of my circumstances, the difficulties, the hardships, the worries, the fear, my soul waits not for my circumstances to change. My soul waits for him. In his word, that's where my hope is. So my soul waits for him. More than a watchman who is waiting and hoping for a shift to be done. More than those who stand in the darkness and wait for the sun to rise. More than parents who want kids to go back to school. Or people who want life to get back to normal. Waiting, longing, and hoping and if we wait and long and hope in the Lord, that hope does not and it will not disappoint. It's interesting to me that as we look at that Lazarus story and just allow the, allow the narrative to just happen, think through the events and how it must have played out with people who were there and the way that they thought and felt and, and how they saw the actions happening, there's a section of our gospel we actually didn't get to that leads into this where people come to Jesus and say, look, Lazarus is very sick. And instead of hurrying off, oh my gosh, let's go fix it. He actually seems to take more time, almost like he's stalling. He seems to delay going to Bethany. And really it's not until he hears that Lazarus has died. The sickness has gone too far. There was no return. And he is dead. And it's really then and only then that Jesus takes a short trip and makes it into Bethany to go to the household of his friends, Martha and Mary, and what used to be the home of his friend, Lazarus. Now, both Martha and Mary, in their own moments, ask Jesus, basically, why weren't you here? Now, it comes across a little more polite than that. Both of them say something along the lines of, if you were here, our brother would not have died. Now, Jesus never disputes this. He never says, "Ah, shucks. Or he never says, oh, no, there's nothing I can do. Instead... For each of them, he has a slightly different response. But in that slightly different response, I think there is a similar goal. So let's look at him for just a moment. Martha, if we remember from our Martha and Mary story from earlier on, Martha was the doer. She was the one cleaning and cooking and preparing so that when Jesus and his disciples were here, she was the one who said, Mary's just sitting there listening to you. Can't you make her help? Well... Martha is the first one to talk to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus' answer 
we'll come to that famous verse, John 14, 6, where resurrection and life is not an idea or an ideal. It's not a, a pathway or a philosophy. It's found in Jesus himself. He says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. The one who believes in me will live even if they die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, Martha says. Yes, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. She comes with the question of why weren't you here sooner? And Jesus answers her with doctrine. He answers her with truth. And there is great power and hope, a hope that does not disappoint. Shortly after, Mary comes to ask, Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And again, Jesus doesn't dismiss the question. He doesn't shrug his shoulders, but he gives a different sort of response completely. Instead of the doctrine and the truth that he offers to Mary, what does he do? He says, where is he? And the people with Mary bring him over to a tomb, and Jesus cries. It's a famous verse because it happens to be the very shortest verse in the Bible, but so much is contained in those two words. Jesus wept. Jesus, Son of Man, Jesus, Son of God, Jesus who is about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and he knows this, he still cries. And it's amazing. It's amazing theologically. It's, a, it's amazing philosophically. It's amazing pastorally where he answers Martha's questions with doctrine and truth, he answers Mary's question with actions, he answers them with compassion, he answers them with his own tears. Tears that life shouldn't be this way. Tears that those whom we know and love shouldn't suffer and get sick, they shouldn't get old, they shouldn't be hurt, they shouldn't die. You look at our world and to see the things that aren't right, that aren't the way that the Lord desires for us. The people still get hurt, hurt one another. The people get sick or make each other sick. The people suffer and cause suffering. The people get weak and frustrated. People get stir-crazy when they're cooped up. People take it out on the ones whom they love the most. People struggle out of work. People fear for their lives. People get sick. And people die. It is the hard and harsh reality of our mortal life of this broken world. And looking at it, Jesus weeps. He weeps out of compassion. He weeps out of love. It doesn't make anything less true of what he said to Martha. It's just the other side of the story. As a whole, Jesus gives a, an answer of both body and spirit. Jesus gives us an answer of both action and truth. For he is the way and the truth and the life. And even though Lazarus will rise again, Jesus still weeps with us. Jesus still stands with us. Jesus still lives in this life of difficulty and in our circumstances with us. And we are never, we are never, we are never alone. Even when we wait and we long and we hope, that hope does not disappoint because Jesus does not disappoint. And I think that's why he takes his time getting there. I think that's why he waits and delays. The illness is allowed to take its natural progression, and it ends with the mortal death of Lazarus. And if he had come, could he have healed him? Absolutely. Would it have been miraculous? Sure it would have. But bringing a man back from the dead, no one will forget that. Everyone who sees it is changed forever. Everyone who hears about it has to think about it for the rest of their lives. 
2,000 years after the fact, people still know the story of Lazarus. For we have seen the power of God. Heard a sermon once that talked about how fearless Lazarus must have been for the rest of his mortal life. Lazarus will die again at some point. Die most likely of natural causes, I don't even remember. But can you imagine someone who has died and come back and what they're afraid of? And I remember hearing the sermon just thinking, yeah, because Lazarus was like, hey man, there's nothing you can do to me I haven't already seen. And I think about that in times like this. For when the crisis first began and, and it increased to the degree where it was going to impact us in our daily lives, it was going to impact us in our church functions, it was going to impact us in our services together, one of the phrases I repeated is, this too shall pass. And I believe it. It's going to end at some point. And frankly, it really will be sooner rather than later. That doesn't mean getting there is going to necessarily be any easier or any more fun. But this too shall pass. And we will not be left without hope. For the same Jesus who comes in power of doctrine and truth, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, is the same Jesus who comes in the power of his compassion, of his love, who stands with us, who weeps with us, who lives and walks with us through that deepest and darkest and most shadowy of valleys. And as we come through this, we will see the glory of God. And like Lazarus, for however many years after being raised from the dead, he continues to live. Should something ever happen to him and anyone ever, are you worried? Are you upset? Are you, are you anxious or scared about this thing that's happening, Lazarus? I can only imagine him saying, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Do you know what's happened to me? I'm Lazarus. Jesus, he's a friend of mine. He's got this. He's got this. This too shall pass. We will come to the end of this quarantine, of this time. And Jesus is a friend of mine. He is a friend of yours. We can come to the end of this. And when the next thing comes rolling our direction, which it always, always will, we say, do you know who I am? Do you know what's happened to me? Do you know how many days I had to keep my own kids at home without pulling my own hair out and theirs? Man, Jesus is a friend of mine. He's got this. And it's going to be okay. We might have to wait. We might have to long. We might have to hope. But hope in Jesus does not and will not disappoint because Jesus does not and will not disappoint. So in life and in death, abide with Christ and he will abide with you.